My name is Daniel Colon Ramos. I am an assistant professor at Yale University, and my lab is interested in understanding how the architecture of structures like the brain forms. And I, you know, I spend most of my time thinking about these questions. But today I wanted to do a little bit something a little bit different. And it actually doesn't have to do directly with, with research, but I wanted to use uh, the brain and you know some general musings to basically think about what, what can we learn about the brain uh, with regards to how we, how we learn, how we generate knowledge, and also how science works. So what I'm gonna be doing today, I'm gonna jump between different topics, and again, this, uh, this is not a science talk, it's more like a general thought talk, but I'm gonna illustrate how, how we think about science and how through collaborations, through creating networks of knowledge, we basically, as scientists, generate new knowledge. And in that, I'm gonna illustrate the importance of cooperativity and the importance of collaboration, which is a topic that's seldom discussed in the sciences, but it's essential for creating a new knowledge and, and, and for furthering the, science, the sciences in general. So the brains are made out of uh, cells that are called neurons. And there are more uh, neurons in a single human brain than there are stars in the whole Milky Way. So there are about 100 billion neurons. So if there are students out there that are watching this talk, next time that you're sitting down and looking at the sky, think that there are more neurons in your brain than there are stars that you're seeing in the skies. And basically, that, so there, there are a lot of them, and they connect in a very specific way. And they actually underlay uh, human behaviors. They, they, they underlay the capacity to communicate, for you to understand this talk. Uh, uh, and their organization is critical in that aspect. So we're interested in this question, in how we said that the architecture of the brain develops. And my lab in particular pursues this question by using the nematode C. elegans as a model organism. C. elegans is a tiny, tiny worm. It's about the size of a comma in a sentence. So some of you might be asking, how is it that you can claim to understand how the human brain, which is so complex, works by looking at such a tiny worm? And I wanted to explain a little bit how we do that because this is actually how, the, the way that we do it and the way that other colleagues in the field that also use C. elegans or use other model organisms do it, actually um, highlights how science is done and how knowledge is generated. So C. elegans, as I mentioned, is really small. And the reason that we use it is because scientists have created tools that allow us to examine questions that will otherwise be very, very complicated to examine. Questions like how is it that you, that you instruct the architecture of a structure like the brain? And in particular, we use C. elegans because it's the only animal for which we know the wiring diagram of the whole nervous system. So somebody sat down and mapped out all of the neurons, all of the cells that form part of the nervous system. And so we know who they're connecting to, where they're positioned, and for many of them we know what behaviors they're important for. And all that knowledge is actually very important because we use that knowledge to generate and to create new knowledge. So why is that knowledge important? And the reason that knowledge is important is because of evolution. So it's thanks to evolution that a lot of the concepts that we find in, for example, in C. elegans, they're actually applicable to other organisms, to other animals, including ourselves. And so much so that in the past 10 years, Six Nobel Prizes have been awarded for people working in C. elegans that have made fundamental discoveries in C. elegans, which were then widely applicable to, to, to other systems, which further our general knowledge of how biology works. And they were recognized then with, with Nobel Prizes. But the important part beyond the prize is that because of evolution, we can use model organisms, be it C. elegans or yeast or flies or mice, to be able to generate fundamental knowledge that then that then uh, can benefit humanity. So that knowledge has told us something fundamental, very important, about how the nervous system works. Be it C. elegans or our own brains, neurons connect to each other and cooperate to form networks. And that cooperativity between these individual cells is what basically underlies the power of the nervous system, the power of our own brain. So a neuron in isolation is is not that powerful, but in combination with other neurons, it's capable of creating all these circuits which then are 
are capable of doing amazing things, like creating a concept of, of, of reality and, and allowing communication. So, but one important aspect is that the number of neurons um, is, is important, but is it more critical than the number of neurons is how they're organized. So much like having a bunch of cables does not make a computer, having a bunch of neurons that are disorganized does not make a nervous system. They have to be organized in a particular way. And again, I want to bring as an example C. elegans. C. elegans only has 302 neurons. So that's far fewer neurons than 100 billion neurons that you find in a single human brain. But those 302 neurons are organized in such a way that allows the animal to create a representation of its world, to find mates, to avoid predators, to find food. And that's what we're interested in. We're interested in understanding how is it that those neurons get organized and how that organization then underlies the behavior of, of the nematode. The human uh, brain is obviously organized in a different way because we don't have the same pressures, the same evolutionary pressures or the same needs as C. elegans. So we are, our brains are wired in a different way as, than the C. elegans brain, thankfully. And one critical aspect of our brain, which is fascinating, at least to me, is that our brains are actually wired to be wired. And what I mean by that is that you know, when C. elegans is born or when reptiles are born, they know what to do. They're, they're almost like their behaviors are wired and they know where to go. But when we are born, when a new baby is born, it's actually, it, it, it's, it looks like a, Aristotle used to call it a tabula rasa. It looks like, a, like the mind is empty. It's not really empty, it's wired. It's wired to achieve something very important. And that something very important is to connect to other humans and to learn from other humans. That's what we are connected to. And that, that capacity of our brain to connect to other people, to be able to learn from others, to be able to build on knowledge that was generated by others before us is fundamental for the sciences. So knowledge, to a certain extent, can be considered a network of networks because our brain is a network and then knowledge that we're generating by connecting our brains to other people is a network of networks. So let me give you an example of how this works in the real science world. So I became interested in understanding how the nervous system of the nematode develops in embryos, but I didn't have the tools to be able to do that. So I collaborated, I linked my brain to two other experts that had tools that were very beneficial to, to my research, and my research was beneficial to theirs. One of them is uh, Sirong Shao, who's a Sloan Kettering. He's a computer scientist turned developmental biologist, and he developed a computer that he trained to be able to observe. Basically, here you have a nematode embryo where the nuclei, the cells, the center of the cells, are labeled in green. And the computer is going to basically visualize this embryo as it's developing. And it's going to keep track of every single cell and the lineage of every cell. So at any given time, the computer, because we, for C. elegans, we know the lineage of every single cell, it knows what each cell is and what it's going to become. So, so you have this tool on one hand. And on the other hand, we also collaborated, Sirong and I, with another scientist. He's a microscopist at the NIH called Harry Shroff. And Harry developed a microscope that was much more powerful than any microscope that existed at the time and allowed us to image the embryo continuously and seamlessly for long periods of time without damaging the embryo. That work was very important. And in combination with these computer tools, allow us to do things that we couldn't do before. So here's that microscope at work looking also at the development of this embryo, but you can see it's happening much faster because this microscope that Harry developed is 30 times faster than the microscopes that we had before. So that, all of a sudden, by linking our brains, we were able to do more than we could have each done individually. And this is actually very important because this is how science is done at all levels. Even if you're claiming to be a scientist that you were completely alone, you're actually you're, you're receiving knowledge from other colleagues that are actually colleagues that could be contemporaries or it could be colleagues that passed away, that generated knowledge before you came along, and you're building on that knowledge. So in that sense, science is actually a network of networks, and it's a community where we're continuously building on other people's knowledge. And um, in, in our case here, we were able to then link what Sirong was doing, what I was doing, and what Harry was doing to then generate videos like the one that I'm showing you here of an embryo that is uh, developing in, in real time. And you can see the neurons in green. You can see the nuclei in red. And all of a sudden, when this embryo starts moving, 
you're going to see that we can actually keep track of the individual cells because the microscope that Harry developed is, is so efficient and so fast. And we can observe neurodevelopmental events that were previously inaccessible. And in that way, answer questions that we couldn't answer before. So I hope that with these examples, I have illustrated to you a little bit how science works, how collaborations work, the importance of collaborations in sciences, which is fundamental but seldom discussed. And if you're interested in these topics and you want to hear more, I invite you to uh, do a Google search of my last name with that blog. I have a blog on this topic and also a TEDx talk that discusses in more depth how, how the importance of basic research in biomedicine. Thank you.